on stuffs blank. Uh, do you mind doing number 26 on 3.7? Uh, 3.7, number 26, you say? Yes. Sure. You got deep into this one, huh? Good job. I, I tried. I don't, I don't think I succeeded, but I definitely tried. All right. The number of yeast cells in a laboratory culture increases rapidly, but levels off eventually. The population is modeled by, a func by the function <clears throat> yada, 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 where T is measured in hours. At time T equals zero, the population is 20 cells and is increasing at a rate of 12 cells per hour. Find the values of A and B according to this, <clears throat> and then according to this model, what happens to the yeast population in the long run, okay? Uh, does anybody recognize this model? This is a logistic model. You might have recognized this. You might not have. It's immaterial, but this is a common like population in a closed environment model. Um, okay, so it says at time t equals zero, there are n cells. So I know f of zero is equal to 20. If I do f of zero, I'm going to have a over 1 plus b to the zero or times e to the zero is equal to 20 or really just 1 over or I'm sorry a over 1 plus b is equal to 20. Everybody's okay with that? Yes. So that's what I can get from here. Since I'm solving for a and b and when I plug in initially I don't get either one isolated. My suspicion is here I'm going to end up with a system of two equations I'm going to be dealing with. Uh, the second equation is going to come from that increase, that population is increasing at a rate of 12 cells per hour. So what is that describing? The slope at time zero, i.e. What am I going to need? The derivative. Yeah. So I'll then take the derivative, and then I'll be able to plug 0 in for that and say that equals 12. So the derivative, remember, what is, <clears throat> what is uh, the variable in this problem? T. Yeah, A and B are just constants. So the way that I would think about this, I think that's a 0.7t, right? Is that right? <coughs> I guess I have the textbook in front of me. Bless you, Sir Sneezy. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm going to think about it this way. Rather than doing a quotient rule, I'm just going to think about it as like a chain rule problem since there's no, deno or no numerator, really. Or the numerator doesn't have a variable in it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So I'm going to have a times negative 1, 1 plus b e to the negative 0.7t to the negative 2. So that's the derivative of the outside. The derivative of the inside, derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of b times e to the negative 0.7t is going to be a chain rule. The derivative of the outer is just the thing, and then times the derivative of the inner is that. And now I'm probably not going to do any simplifying yet because my equation that I'm looking for is when the derivative is evaluated at zero. So let me go through and 
when I plug zero in for t, that just becomes, kind of goes away. Plug zero in for t, that just kind of goes away. Let's write that out front though. So these guys kind of. So what do I have here? I have uh, 0.7a times b over 1 plus ab squared. And that's going to equal, it said, 12. Pretty cool there. So this is the system I'm going to be solving then. How do you want to try to solve this system? Sure, substitution feels like a good a good route to go. And either solving for A or B in the first equation should be fine. I might actually even um, solve for A in the first equation. Since there's only one place to sub in, it might make when I substitute that into the second equation then a little bit nicer or not quite so messy. So that's going to be 14 B plus B squared over 1 plus B squared equals 12. Oops. I got squared migrated into the wrong spot on me. There we go. Everybody's okay with what I got here? How do I solve an equation like this? Uh, well, I would rather than that, I would probably multiply both sides by the 1 plus b squared to get rid of the fraction. and then distribute things out. I'm gonna do that all in one step. Because once I've done that, what do I really have now? Just a quadratic equation, right? To solve this, we can get everything onto one side. I'm gonna put it all onto the left side. So I subtract 12b squared from both sides, subtract 24b from both sides, and then subtract 12 from both sides. Can divide both sides by 2. So when I factor, I get uh, b minus 6 times b plus 1. So b equals 6 or b equals negative 1. Okay. To solve for a then, I'm going to go back and grab this equation, just plug them in, right? Now, one of these is clearly nonsense, right? Which one is nonsense? 
when a equals 0, right? That can't happen. So we should have then a equals 140 and b equals 6. So then it says what happens in the long run, so if we take the limit as t goes to infinity, I can send that through. The limit of the numerator is just 140 because it's a constant. The limit of 1 is just 1 because it's a constant. I can pull the co or the coefficient out front, and really all I need to worry about here is the limit. Oops. As t approaches infinity of e to the negative 0.7t. Everybody's okay with that? When I have e to the negative, and we're going, or e to the negative x going to infinity, what did I get? Well, let's think about it this way then. A negative exponent is the same as like the reciprocal, right? So 1 over big is not just small, 0. So yes, John, you were correct that that 140 is the kind of the max population. Remember, a logistic function kind of looks like this. Or it has two horizontal asymptotes. And that's why would there be a like a maximum population in this city situation? Yeah, there's the cells are on like a little, you know, petri dish or whatever. Like there's only so much space in that petri dish. Eventually you run out of space and you just can't have any more bacteria cells. Blake, how'd it go? How'd it go? Uh, I went better than I tried it. The calculus, pretty light. The algebra, there's kind of a lot of algebra. <laughs> it's a lot like an algebra 2 or 3 calc problem, right? We just ended up with like a crummy system to solve. The hardest part was realizing that like, oh, this information I can plug into the function, and this information I can get it plug into the derivative, and then I can use those two s equations to solve a system. Yeah. The system wasn't bad once you got into it. Right, but getting to the point where you could get to the system was definitely the hardest part, I think. Um, great. Who's next? Luke. Yeah, in the same section. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's go over here. We'll insert Arena. All right. The gas law for an ideal gas at, at, at absolute temperature T in Kelvins, pressure P in atmospheres, and volume V in liters is PV equals nRT. That should look familiar. Where N is the number of moles of the gas and R is the gas constant. Suppose that at a certain instant, the pressure is 8 to 8 atmosphere and increasing at a rate of 0.1 atmosphere per minute. Volume is 10 liters and decreasing at a rate of 0.15 liter per minute. Find the rate of change of t with respect to time at the instant 
at that instant if the number of moles is equal to 10. Okay. So we have the equation PV equals nRT, right? And let's look at what we're given in the problem. We're told P is equal to 0.8 or 8 atmospheres. And then it says it's increasing at a rate of 0.1 atmosphere per minute. What is that quantity? What would I call that? Yeah, it's a slope, sure. A rate of change, yes. What is changing? Pressure per minute. So per time, everybody agree? So I'd call this dp dt. Very cool. And then I know the volume is 10 liters. And it says decreasing at a rate of 0.15 liter per minute. What is that point or decreasing at 0.15 liter per minute? dv dt, which is negative because it's decreasing, 0.15 liter per minute. And then we're told that n is the number of moles. Keep in mind, if I'm heating up a gas or changing its temperature or its pressure or whatever, is the number of moles going to change? No, that's constant, right? And this thing, it says, uh, find the rate of change of T with respect to time. So we're looking for dt dt. at absolute temperature T in kelvins. Is that absolute temperature T saying it's like absolute zero? What is it saying there? Because we need a T still. Let's go look at that. That suspiciously sounds like something I'm supposed to uh, Oh, yeah, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. All right, never mind. I don't need a T. So, notice that I have all of these guys in here that I'm interested in or know about. What am I going to do? I'm going to start by taking this gas law and solving it for T. And then I'm going to differentiate with respect to T. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time of both sides. Time, not temperature, because the rates were all per minutes, right? So that becomes just dt dt well really times one but like whoop did he do now keep in mind n and r are constants so i can kind of suck those out front is this okay so far luke now p how do i do the derivative of pv Product rule, yes. So now it's just time to plug everything in. So N was 10 moles. That gas constant was 0.8. 0.0821. Yes, sir. 
Why would it be P times the? Uh, so the one is the derivative of P, and then I get the dP dt because I'm differentiating P with respect to a variable other than P. Okay, so pretty much what you're treating that as like how we did one. It's just like implicit differentiation, okay. right? Just like implicit differentiation, right? Like we did in section five or something, right? And the pressure was eight, right? Was that right it was? Yeah. And the DVDT, I have this open. Why don't I just look at it out of the book? was negative 0.15 because it was decreasing and the pressure was increasing and it said the volume was 10 and that ought to do her grind that guy out on your calculator does that feel okay Luke? Yeah. I didn't recognize the yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't recognize that those are derivatives, that's tough. In general, though, when you read a story problem and you see like something as a rate in calculus class, that's a derivative. That's almost always going to be a derivative. Um, and problems like a story problem like this, almost always, the derivative, the derivative will be respect to time. So that's almost always what you'll be running into. Uh, others, anybody else? These are two good ones, guys. These were complicated problems for sure. You guys knocked out some toughies that you don't have to worry about anymore, which is great. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't have to, what do you mean you just have to worry about, but like you saw how to do them, right? Blake? If you run through like number five, like, in the same section, same section. yeah. <clears throat> so this is we're looking at the their gra their graphs, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is a good one to ask about too. So we talked about this a little <laughs> bit in uh, the notes yesterday, but we didn't talk about it in a way that you would have needed to do this problem. All right. So remember yesterday, let me find the spot. Oh boy. Okay. Just everybody settle down. Oh, sorry. It wasn't here. So this is what we need to answer this question for five. We can use the same speeding up and slowing down criteria that we used yesterday. The problem is all we have is the graph of the position. We don't have the graph of velocity or acceleration. Now, from the graph of position, is it easy to figure out when the velocity is positive and negative? Yeah, because it's the same as the slope on the position graph. Yeah, derivative is fine, but same as the slope. The acceleration is the derivative of the derivative. What is that going to look like? So like the acceleration positive, this is equivalent to the position graph being concave up. So what do you mean by concave up? You mean like looks like this. Like if you're dumping water in there, that would be like a cup that you could catch it. And the acceleration being negative is equivalent to the position graph being concave down. 
And what does concave down look like? Like the umbrella, right? Or if you're dumping water on it, it's gonna run off. Everybody's cool? So if I take those criteria from above and this new way of looking at the graph, what I'm looking for here, so for speeding up, we're looking for positive slope and concave up or negative slope and concave down and then for slowing we're looking for positive slope and concave down and then negative slope and concave up So if I look at part A, I notice right away that this is a spot where we've stopped, right? So not surprisingly, if we do red as slow and green as go, very cool with that, or yellow as, did I say red as slow? I meant yellow. Well, colors are hard, guys. Um, that coming into a place where we're stopping, we're slowing down, right? We're increasing, but we're concave down. After we've stopped, we notice that, hey, we're um, concave down and decreasing, probably to about here. And notice down here, it starts looking like it's concave up again. So we're probably slowing down, getting ready to stop again. So what I would answer for this one is I would say, okay, from time one to two, we're speeding up, and from times zero to one, and then two to three, we're slowing down. Everybody's okay with that? For the other one, I would kind of do the same thing. I notice I'm stopping at those two spots. So here we're decreasing, so negative slope, and we're concave up at slowing down. And then from here to here, we're increasing and concave. Um, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, yeah, there's probably like an inflection point somewhere in there, right? Like it's probably one of these guys. Because we're definitely like cupping it there, but we're definitely running off like there. So I think there's probably a little spot in between at like 1.5 where it changes concavity there. Sometimes those are tough to see. And then from here, we're concave down and negative. So that's green says go the whole way through. And I'm not going to write those intervals like you guys can write the intervals at that point. I don't know, right? That's not hard. Um, but this is a little bit sneaky because we didn't talk about this concavity idea. This is something that comes up in Chapter 4 quite a bit. And we start looking for max and mins without a calculator for any kind of function. Um, so I'm surprised that I liked the question, but I'm kind of surprised that they put it here since there wasn't a big discussion of concavity as relating to this, but it's good. It's good. Make it that much easier when we see it again, that we've seen it a little bit already, right? So on the first segment there, you have positive velocity. On A or B? Or of A. Okay. So you have positive velocity, but you're reaching that, or sorry, A. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have a positive velocity, but then you're reaching that concave down, so you're slowing down there. Right? Mm -hmm. But wouldn't in the second section you still have a positive velocity because it's not the rule, the x-axis there? 
Uh, so the, the positive velocity is just the slope. So this second section, the slope is negative. Okay. Even though it's above the x-axis, right? Because this is a position graph we're looking at, not a velocity graph. And so you have the double negative, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. And then for the second one, you have... For part B? No, for the other second, the part A. Okay. The green or yellow? The yellow. The second yellow? Yeah. Okay. So you're having a still slope negative, still slope right? Negative, but you're reaching concave up. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Jack. I might be missing something. Wasn't that saying a question about these other velocity graphs? Oh. <coughs> yup. I did the same thing. I think, it's I think someone asked me about six, and I just read. Uh, right. Sorry. Well, we. Because A, you know how it says A right by the y axis? So I saw A, and something in my brain was like, it's T versus like the oh. Y axis. Yeah. 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 I yeah. yeah. So, so what we just, the answers I have on here are wrong. This stuff I did here, this is all true, but we'd use this for number six where you're given a position function. <coughs> Sorry. For five, this is velocity. So we know that there's two things we need to check. We need um, velocity needs to be positive and acceleration needs to be positive. Or velocity needs to be negative and acceleration needs to be negative. So the velocity is positive here. The acceleration is positive, or the slope is positive, so we have like that section. And then so the other section needs to be slowing down. And then the velocity is negative um, here. And the acceleration is also negative there. So we should be, again, um, that should be a speeding up situation, right? So that's, that's it. Does that feel okay? My apologies. And again, obviously, like, when the velocity is zero, we're stopped, right? My apologies. Blake, I'm sorry. It's okay. I did. Dang, I really, I really messed this one up. I did six with the other class, and I looked at the picture, and I'm like, oh, that's the same thing that we did. That's the same thing. I didn't even read the directions because I'm a bonehead. What do you mean? So this is where the velocity is positive. This is where it's negative. Just means you're going backwards. Oh, okay. Right? Like you got to think about it just as a, on a line, okay. just going back and forth on a line. Okay. And just like one dimensional motion kind of thing. Does that feel okay? All right. My apologies. Uh, let's do 3 8. <coughs> so 3.8 has almost no calculus in it. This is almost all going to be like Algebra 2 and pre-calc problem. <coughs> this is the... This is the calculus part right here. It says the only solutions of the differential equation dy dt equals ky. 
are the exponential functions y of t equals y naught e to the kt. That's y of zero. It's like it. It's think about it as like f of t and f of zero, right? Right. Um. So that's the calculus part. Is that you can use like when you have that the rate of change for y is linear. you get an exponential function. Or that came from an exponential function. That's it. That's all it's saying. Paul. Oh. That's all it's saying. So if I look at the example here, it says use the fact that the world population was 2,560 million in 1950 and 3,040 million in 1960 to model the population of the world in the second half of the 20th century. Assume that the population growth is proportional to the population size. That part is saying that this is the situation we're in. What, what is the relative growth rate? Yeah, but that's why I wanted to be all zoomed out so you could see it at the same time. And then Glasses McGee that sits in the back of the class is like, can you zoom in? Uh, you know? So that's, the calculus is now done. Everything after here is algebra. Oh, okay. So what I'm gonna do, where it says 1950, I'm going to think about that as T0. So 2,560 means that's P0. So I can say that. 1960 then would be where T is 10. So 3,040 would be P of 10. I can use that then to solve for K. Pretty all right with that? What do I have to do to solve for K? What do I need to do to solve for k? Not yet. Divide by 2,560, then take the natural log of both sides, then divide by 10. When I type that into my calculator, I get approximately 0 0.0171825. But we need to write this as a rate, right? Because it says, what is the relative growth rate? So 1.7% per year. What, what, like, what would you call K? You know, like, what's that? K is just like a constant. Okay. Because K is a constant. I know. Yeah. It is. No, Jillian's right. K is for constant. <laughs> Okay, it then says use the model to estimate the world population in 1993. So 1993 where would be T of 43. So we want just P of 43. Let 
when I type that in, I get 5,360 million. And then predict in the year 2020, that's times 70, so we just want P of 70. When I do that, I get eight mil or eight thousand five hundred and twenty four million. I don't know. I think it was like seven point five. <clears throat> Projected to be eight billion in November of this year, seven point seven billion in twenty twenty. Dang, they're off by a whole billion. That's wrong. Well. What do you suppose changed? Well, I would say modern agriculture is probably the biggest factor is places that were starving are no longer starving quite as much. Well, I'm saying that, but, but we have, but it's like, like oh, the is like high. Trees. So wouldn't, it, wouldn't that mean that we as a, as we as a globe have stopped at yeah, depend to compare to 1950, absolutely. May, mostly because the West population rate has gone way, way down from the 1950s, right? Like, and even like China, what did China do? One child policy really cr slowed their population growth down a ton. You know. All right. Next example says the half life of radium 226 is 1,500 years. A sample of radium 226 is a math, mass of 100 milligrams. Find the formula for the mass of a sample that remains after T years. Does this fit the criteria for our formula? What's the rate of change for Y? It's, a, it's always the same, right? It's a half-life, right? So like, is that linear? Yeah, of course it is. So yeah, it, 100%. Plus, we know that this is something that's clearly like needs an exponential model from our previous course. No surprise there. All right, uh, we need to write our equation. What's P0? Nope. It's 100, right? That's the amount of radium we have at time zero. Now we need another measurement, right? We need a measurement. Where's that other measurement? Where's my T and P of T? I read this and it doesn't seem a super obvious where it is. It's this first sentence, right? So I can say 50 is equal to 100 e to the k times 1,590. Oh yeah, I see it now. Solve for K, what do we need to do? Divide by 100 then, natural log and last. Yeah. Now 
Now, I want to warn you here, the textbook doesn't just type this into the calculator and give a decimal. I want to show you the reason why they chose not to do it that way. So when we did that, we get that, which is just a lot of decimals to carry along, right? So I have three leading zeros and then all that stuff. What do they do instead? Well, if you think about this as one half, you can apply your quotient property for logarithms. To write it like that. What's log of 1? Zero. Remember, anything to the zero power is 1. So that just becomes negative log 2 over 1590. That's the way they're going to write their k. All right, fine, whatever. Would it have been wrong to use the decimal? No. I just wanted to warn you. So when you go back and you start looking for answers in the back of the book, if you see something weird like that, it's like, uh, what? It's going to be the, it's the same as the decimal you typed into your calculator. Probably. And just that they simply, you know, like held on to all the values or whatever. Bless you. Says, find the mass after a thousand years, correct to the nearest milligram. What am I doing there? Yeah, plug a thousand in for T, man. Ain't no big deal. Hundred times e to the answer times a thousand. Thousand. So about sixty-five milligrams. I think it said to round to the nearest milligram in the problem. Part C says, when will the mass be reduced to thirty milligrams? What am I doing there? Yeah, so 30 is my P of T, and we're looking to solve for T. Okay. How do I solve for T there? Divide by 100, then natural log, and then... Yeah, I'm going to write it as probably multiplication of the reciprocal, right? That's probably easier way to write it. But yeah. So if I do that, um, ooh, Boise, I just did a whole bunch of something there. That's not what I wanted to do. Here I am. Back down there. Where's my thingy jigger? Okay. I was trying to grab this number because I just wanted the reciprocal of that times the natural log of 30 over 100. So about 2,762 years. okay there not really a big deal in general this section should be pretty algebra 2 e pre calci not a lot of calci um, I only asking you guys to do a couple of problems from this section as a result just to like say we did it uh, so I'd like 3 5 9 11 13 and 19 so just six problems on 242.
And we're going to start section 3.9 today as well. Um, 3.9 is probably the most, will be end up being the most difficult section, chapter 3. We're going to take more than just the 20 minutes or so that we have left today on it. Um, but I want to start and do, start with some examples here. So 3.9 is a, this title of the section is Related Rates. So this is gonna be, um, the calculus component of this is gonna be very similar to like the implicit differentiation section. The hard part is going to be decoding what you're given in the story problem and how to turn that into an equation and get that when we take the derivative of, we have the right pieces to plug in. So this is a reading comprehension is really the name of the game kind of chapter. And what helps us on these sorts of things? Experience and practice, right? Me talking about it is gonna be not that helpful. It's gonna be very, you gotta spend some time, you gotta work on it, you gotta read the question and read it again and think about what does this mean and draw a picture and think about what does this mean and make sure you're able to do that kind of thing consistently. So I want to spend a couple of days here with me doing some examples and you guys working. Um, all right. So let's, we're going to run through two examples here today. These are like the two most basic, or like two basicest kind of level examples where it's going to be pretty easy, or I, should, I shouldn't say easy, pretty comfortable as a related rate problem goes. Um, as we go deeper into here, it'll get, they get more difficult because the situations get more complex to visualize. <clears throat> So example one here says air is being pumped into a spherical balloon so that its volume increases at a rate of 100 centi cubic centimeters per second. How fast is the radius of the balloon increasing when the diameter is 50 centimeters? So let's picture what's happening here. What does this sound like is happening? So you're basically like blowing up a balloon, right? You're pumping air in, the balloon is getting bigger. It's looking at the rate in which the balloon's radius is changing when the volume coming in is this fixed rate. Everybody's okay with that? So the first thing I'd wanna do is come up with an equation that kind of describes the situation. What is the shape that we're dealing with? Sphere. And what is the quantity that's kind of changing that we're adding to it? A volume. Okay, so the equation I'm going to need is the volume of a sphere. You guys remember that? Yes, well done. Um, I'm still a little hazy as to whether the expectation is that on the AP exam you would remember these things or not. Um, my suspicion is it probably kind of gets mentioned somewhere in the problem, but some of these most basic geometric figures you probably want to like refresh your memory for like volume and cylinder and box and cone are probably enough to be safe. But okay. Now let's look at what we're given. It says its volume increases at a rate of 100 cent cubic centimeters per second. What is this? What would I call that? What's the name for this variable that is equal to 100 cubic centimeters per second? The units should help. It's, it's like the, it's a derivative because it's a rate. Very good. What is the numerator of that rate? A measure of? Volume. Volume. And the denominator? So it's going to be? 
DVDT. Yeah. Everybody cool with that? The question then asks, how fast is the radius of the balloon increasing? <clears throat> what is it asking for there? Yes. But it says when the diameter is 50 centimeters. Now, do you like diameter equal to 50? No. Yeah, why would that be a better way of writing that? If I look at the equation, right, R is in my equation. Everybody cool? All right. If I look at that volume equation, do I have a dVdt or a drdt in it? No. So what am I going to have to do to that equation? Take the derivative. Yeah, we got to take the derivative. With respect to which variable? <coughs> Time t, yes. And I can tell that just from the rates. So the derivative with respect to time of v is just going to be dv dt times 1. But like, who cares about the times 1, really? What's the derivative with respect to time of 4 thirds pi r cubed? Well, I can take that, the constants out front, right? So I'm just doing the derivative with respect to time of r cubed. It's going to be 3r squared dr dt. And then I notice that those 3s can cancel out. Everybody happy here? OK, so let's plug in now. dv dt we said was 100. R we said we care about then when R is 25. And we're solving for dr dt. And when I plug that through, I get point, uh, zero 0.0127. What should the unit be on that number? Very good. We measured the radius in centimeters and time we were measuring in seconds. So that's it. Once you've decoded the words, the calculus is pretty easy, right? The calculus is light. Figuring out what equation I needed, what variables the numbers represented, how to get my equation that I started with into a form where all my variables, or the, all the quantities I had the numbers for were represented. That was the challenge, right? So it's very much like a reading comprehension. Can I understand the words and what they're describing and what these quantities are represented? John? Is the difference between these kind of problems and the very little very little um, these will get more complicated but Is it just like the, with respect to like the um, so I yeah it, it's it was not the the answer is not that gas example that's why I chose it uh, okay. was it because it is I've been trying to choose story problems that were essentially related rate problems this whole time that's 
the goal when I've been going through and picking the problems. I've been like, yep, this is a situation I need to, we want to see before. Yep, this is a good one. Because, you know. Now, this is the, the basicest level because what we found was everything we needed to do the problem we were given, right? The equation that we chose and the stuff we were provided was all I needed. That will not always be the case. And that is when the problems get more difficult. And we'll look at those situations, not today, but next time we'll start looking at situations where that happens. Um, we'll do one more of these kind of the basicest situations. And then we'll take a break, let you guys process and try a couple of these as part of your homework set. Um, and we'll come back and look at some more of these. It says a ladder 10 feet long rests against a vertical wall. If the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall at a rate of one foot per second, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the bottom of the ladder is six feet from the wall? Okay, so I'm gonna start by drawing a situation here, or drawing the situation. Because here it's not so obvious like what the equation would be, right? So I'm gonna draw a picture. There's my wall, there's the ground, there's my ladder. What can I always assume about a wall and a ground? Yeah, yep, they meet at a right angle, so they're perpendicular. Now I'm gonna represent this quantity down here as x, that's the distance from the base of the wall to the, um, the end of the ladder. And this quantity is y, that's the distance from the bottom of the wall to the top of the ladder. Everybody's okay with that? What equation would I use in this situation? Pythagorean theorem. But you agree we have a right triangle here. All right. Uh, we've labeled where the 10 goes, right? And it says if the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall at a rate of one foot per second, what is that quantity? dx dt, right? So it's a rate. The denominator of the unit is time, so we know it's dt. And then which quantity is it changing? In our picture, we wrote that as x. That's the distance from the bottom of the ladder to the base of the wall. says, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall? What is that quantity? <laughs> dy dt. Uh, when the bottom of the ladder is six feet from the wall. So I'll do that. Everybody's cool? Okay. Well, Calculus time. So if I take my derivative, what's the derivative of x squared with respect to time? 2x dx dt. What's the derivative of y squared with respect to time? Two y dy dt. What's the derivative of ten squared with respect to time? Zero. Okay. So filling in what I know, I know that x is six, dx dt is one. But we have a little bit of a problem here. What's my problem? I 
I don't know what Y is. Did we make a mistake? No. Can we figure out what Y is? Yes. yes. How? <coughs> Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. Oops. Okay. So I can say then dy dt is going to equal negative 12 divided by 16 or negative 0.75 feet per second. Uh, does it make sense that the velocity is negative? Why? Because it's sliding down, right? It's going in the negative y direction. So that, that's good. Everybody's good with where the negative 12 over 16 came from? Subtract the 12 over and divide by the 16. Right? Because this is 12 and 16 now. Okay. We're stopping here for today. Um, the assignment for this section, 3, 5, 11, 12, 17, 23, 24, 26, and 27. <coughs> try to do or start or try 3 and 5 before next time so we have something to kind of talk about. So try to do three and five at least before next time. Obviously other things, but from this section, I don't think you'd be well prepared to do much past three and five without seeing some more examples. But we should try to do three and five, okay? So I know there's a lot of other problems, and if you're not to three and five, that doesn't matter. Do three and five before you do anything else, just so that when we come in next time, we've tried some stuff and we're a little bit more ready and get a little bit more out of our questions and everything. Okay? Anise? Sure. And this feels like a good stopping spot to me, so I'm going to stop here.